All right. While that's warming up, let me uh, just mention that it's really been a pleasure to be here and meet with you all this week, eat some meals together, sometimes on time, <laughs> and sometimes when we can get here. Uh, but uh, it's always good to have a gospel meeting, and especially one that may be available after this week is over. That didn't used to be the case, but now it is, and we're grateful for that technology. There is only one question that did not come from Google, and that's the one that's tonight's. Now, the reason we're doing it, however, is because whenever you present a lesson on salvation, or whenever you present a lesson on baptism, as we talked about last night, almost invariably the first question is, what about the thief on the cross? I think this must be the most commonly asked question uh, when you get to that point in discussing salvation. I was uh, sitting around uh, trying to imagine what other questions people might have. One of the, if you had to choose, one of the most popular verses or the most popular scriptures that people say? Well, uh, one of those, I believe, one of the top five verses or phrases taken from the New Testament or relating to the New Testament First would probably be John 3.16. You can't even watch a football game without seeing that in the end zone. Uh, John 3.16. And of course, it's an excellent verse. We don't have any uh, problem with any Bible verse. We shouldn't have, anyway. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is a great verse. Uh, I've heard many preachers break it down phrase by phrase and preach an entire sermon on it. And yes, it does emphasize faith, which is absolutely essential in having salvation. However, many people seem to think it says faith only. But it does not say that, and we'll talk more about that distinction in a few moments. It went blank for some reason. Uh, <laughs> is that a common occurrence? Well, anyway, the next one on the list. Go back. Go back? Okay. There. There? Oh, okay, well, you have it, but I don't have it. Okay, this one is blank, so I'll have to peek out to the side. The next one that I came up with was Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, and not of works, uh, it's the gift of God. So... That is oftentimes because, used because he mentions grace and faith. And uh, some people seem to want to stop when they get to faith. All right, the third one that I came up with, and I know you've heard this from people, and that is, judge not that you be not judged. Usually this comes from somebody who's committing a sin, that they don't want to give up. Uh, they do not know what the passage says. They do not know what it means. They've probably never heard of John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. No, they just fixate on that one verse, and uh, it's like, you know, I said this verse, so now don't talk to me anymore. And one like that is, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Of course, that was said by Jesus to the woman who was taken in adultery. And he was making a point, wasn't he, to the people there. And they were guilty. And they walked out. So they 
they use this scripture to try again to get you to leave them alone as, as though you're bothering them. No, it's actually the scriptures that are bothering them uh, when they realize they're doing something wrong. John chapter 8 and verse 7. Well, and then that brings us to the thief on the cross. Because as we said, that's the one thing when you get through looking at passages of Scripture that have anything to do with salvation and baptism as part of that salvation. It's, it's what about the thief on the cross? Well, we'd like to examine that this evening because it is a good question. We don't mind questions, even those that are asked uh, for pointed reasons. As long as they're biblical questions, that's fine. So we're happy to take a look at this one and give an answer. Many people wonder, why was the thief on the cross saved and never baptized? Was he saved by faith alone? The first thing we want to point out is that it is an assumption that the thief was never baptized. No one can prove that. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region round the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So what do we read? That at the time that John was preaching, John the baptizer was preaching, all of this area went out to be baptized by him. All of that area around the region of Jordan. So John extensively preached about three years prior to Jesus' crucifixion. And this thief could have been baptized of John and then fallen away, either taken up in ill pursuit or fallen back into uh, one. And uh, people do do that. They fall away from the truth or maybe out of weakness, maybe out of the people that he knew, his confederates. Whatever reason, he could have been baptized and then become a thief once more. Now somebody might say, huh, do you know that? No. I couldn't prove that he had. I just know that the scripture says that everybody went out to be baptized by John. No, I, and furthermore, I don't have to prove it. Because the burden of proof lies on the part of the one who says the thief was not baptized. They're the ones that need proof. I've shown that the alternative is possible. But how are they going to show that the thief was never baptized? So the truth is, we don't know either way. But let's leave that alone for the moment then and go on to talk about whether he was saved by faith alone or saved by faith. Now, there are two other examples. The thief on the cross is the one who is always mentioned, but Luke mentions two others that were saved by faith. And the first one is in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. If that doesn't match sometime, let me know. <laughs> All right. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36. In this situation, <clears throat> Jesus has in, been invited to someone's house for a meal, and while he's there, this event help, uh, happens. Uh, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. 
And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to uh, himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman this was who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. They owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven her, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And there, uh, those who sat at the table with him began to say to this, uh, themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus told her, Your sins are forgiven. That suggests salvation, does it not? But in case anyone missed it, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Well, next we want to go to another illustration from Luke chapter 19, same author, verses 1 through 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he went ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all uh, complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it for, uh, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Notice, today salvation has come to this house. So here are two other events preceding the crucifixion in which someone was clearly saved by faith. And then there is the thief. Now Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. Notice that Jesus did not say today you and I are going to be in purgatory. Jesus didn't say that because there is no such place as purgatory. Jesus did not tell him, good news, today we're going to be annihilated. 
Well, there's a lot of people who believe in annihilation, and that's what's going to happen after people die. But no, that's not what Jesus told him either. He said, today you and I will be in paradise. Now, why is the thief the only one of the three that is usually mentioned? Zacchaeus is clearly saved. So is the sinful woman of Luke chapter 7. Your faith has saved you. Some people confuse, however, people being saved by faith and being saved by faith alone. Were any of the three saved by faith alone? We read enough of the text that you can answer that question. No, they weren't saved by faith alone. So let's notice what else was present. What other elements did we find in all three of these accounts? Well, first of all, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 38, she knew who Jesus was. This is not just some random person wandering in and doing this. She knew who Jesus was. And she performed actions of, of devotion and worship. The washing and kissing of his feet. It is nothing that she said. I don't recall any words. But rather what she did that convinced Jesus of her love and true repentance. So there are other elements that are involved. There was love on her part and true repentance. What about Zacchaeus? Evidence of repentance. I'm giving half of my goods to feed the poor. I'm, uh, if I have wronged anyone, I restore fourfold what I've taken. And Jesus said, today has salvation come to this house based on his repentance. But what about the thief? Well, believe it or not, the thief also showed repentance. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Verses 41 through 44. Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 41. The text says, Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and the elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. You know, it, it can't be this way, but I've often wondered what they would have done if all of the nails would have just popped out and Jesus would have floated down from the cross. I, I don't think they still would have believed, do you? But anyway, they taunted him by asking him to do that. Uh, he trusted in God, let him now uh, deliver him if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Well, the thief did not start off very good, did he? He joined in with Jesus' enemies. Both thieves did. And reviled Jesus at that particular time. But somewhere along the way, one of the thieves had a change of heart. Why? We don't know. Perhaps it was hearing Jesus' plea for forgiveness. How many that have ever been crucified saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? That was certainly different. Probably many people who had been crucified railed against those, insulted those who were in the crowd. They didn't have much else to lose, did they? So they could pretty much say anything they wanted to at that point. Jesus didn't do that. Maybe it was his demeanor and how he conducted himself while he was on the cross. Whatever the reason was, 
one thief repented, which is demonstrated by his defense of Jesus. Let's go back to Luke, because Luke is the one that records it in chapter 23, verses 41 and 42. Well, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up to uh, the verse 39 where we see both of the criminals uh, blaspheming him, saying, if you were the Christ, or one of the criminals said, if you were the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, having been on the cross for a period of time now, had a change of heart. And he answered and rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That was evidence of repentance. The woman in Luke 7 was saved by faith, but not faith alone. She demonstrated love and repentance toward Jesus. Zacchaeus demonstrated it by parting with something he probably prized very highly, money. But he was willing to give it up and to repent of any of the ways that he might have acted improperly. And the thief, yes, he started out reviling like the others. But he came to his senses, in a sense, and uh, decided to defend Jesus while on the cross. That's repentance. So all of them are saved by faith, but not faith alone. The other elements are present in all of those cases. And that's the point. All of these that Luke describes show repentance on the part of the one being saved, which means that none of them was saved by faith only. Did faith save them? Yes, but not faith only. Every one of them repented of their sins and showed it, showed evidence of it. Nowhere in the New Testament is anyone said to be saved by faith only. But there's another question someone might ask at this point. Okay, you've convinced me it wasn't by faith only, but the text doesn't say that any of them were baptized. No, it doesn't. That's correct. Do you know why? The answer is that they were not under the new covenant yet. Baptism was not required under the law of Moses for forgiveness. You can read all the way through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, anything later on. There's no command to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It's not in the law of Moses. It is part of the new covenant. The new covenant is the one that teaches to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, John baptized folks and so did Jesus, but it was in anticipation of the new covenant. It was in anticipation of what would be the case. They were still under the law, they still had to keep the law, but looking ahead, they could go ahead and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, of course, those baptized by John had to be baptized again later on. But this was a special opportunity given from heaven to men. But it's not part of the law of Moses. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator liveth. So they 
were under the old covenant. Jesus had not yet died. They did not have to be baptized until the new covenant took effect. The new covenant that requires baptism did not take effect until Jesus died. The sinful woman lived under the Old Testament law. So did Zacchaeus. So did the thief. Jesus had still not died when he made the promise to the thief. They all lived and died under the law of Moses. They had faith and had repented. Under the law, this was all that was required. The law didn't require baptism. And so they did not need to be baptized. But we live under the new covenant. We have never been under the law of Moses. That was nailed to the cross hundreds of years ago. But we are part of the New Testament and the gospel was preached and set forth on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, when people asked, what shall we do? They asked that question because Peter proved to them that the scriptures showed that Jesus would be raised from the dead, quoting from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, written by David. David wrote and prophesied of the resurrection. And uh, so he quotes David, and then also adds to that that we are all witnesses that Jesus was raised from the dead. So then they wanted to know what they should do, and Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is the current and final covenant that we have. Looking at a couple of verses here in Hebrews again, Hebrews 9, 12. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, or goats and calves rather, but with his own blood, he entered into the holy place, the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus was able to get eternal redemption for us. Chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus made that sacrifice, and we are part of that covenant. That's why we don't have sacrifices that we make Every week we don't have sacrifices we make every month. We don't have sacrifices we make every year. We don't have a day of atonement as they had in the Old Testament. Jesus took care of our sacrifice once and for all. And it was available for all. But it requires baptism in order to wash sins away after we have faith and repentance. So we want to notice what we have up here. First of all, there is faith. And then second of all, you, well, first of all, there's hearing the gospel. You have to hear it first and then have faith and believe it. And then you need uh, to repent of your sins then you need to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Then you need to be baptized to have the sins washed away, and the blood of Jesus does that for you when you're baptized. And then you have to be faithful unto death. Now, I know this may sound a little silly, but uh, can you imagine somebody coming out to John and saying, you know, my pastor said I didn't have to be baptized, John. John would probably say, well, what are you doing here in the middle of the river then? What do you mean? We get calls all the time. Somebody will, uh, will call the building and they'll say, can I talk to the pastor? And I answer, we don't have a the pastor. That's not the kind of government that God set up. Pastors plural, 
as in elders or bishops. But we don't have the pastor who runs the congregation and tells everybody what to do. And it's a good thing we don't because they'd be telling people not to be baptized, wouldn't they? In fact, that's what they do. No, that's not the way to approach salvation. It doesn't matter what a man says. What do the scriptures say? Peter was an inspired apostle of God. He ranks a little bit higher than the pastor. He was inspired of God. Human beings are not. We shouldn't listen to what human beings tell us. I, uh, we had a, a woman almost baptized, but we went to see her and she said, oh, my friend said I didn't need to be. And I said, what do you mean your friend said that? What, what do the scriptures say? Well, she told me I didn't need to be and I'm just going to take her word for it. No wonder people are lost. If they're going to take a human being's word for it, instead of the inspired word of God. I don't understand that kind of thinking. Um, as somebody who was not raised in the church, when I asked a question about various things, I got a scriptural answer. Well, the scriptures say this. And so it never occurred to me to ever disagree with the scriptures because I understood they were the authority. But it doesn't seem to bother a lot of people to disagree with what the scriptures virtually, literally say. And that's sad because it, it causes some to be lost instead of going on and obeying what the truth is. No, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Are we willing to humbly submit to him and walk in the ways that the Bible says? Blessed are the poor in spirit. First beatitude that Jesus gave. Why poor in spirit? Because people need to be humble. It's not what I think about it. It's not what somebody else who venerates himself thinks about it. The only thing that matters is what does God think about it? And we know the answer to that because we know the message that was given, declared on Pentecost, and repeated all through the New Testament, especially the book of Acts and oftentimes in some of the letters and epistles as well. This evening, have you obeyed that gospel? Don't let some human being talk you out of it on their own say-so, on their own authority. Jesus said, all authority is given unto me. Listen to what he says. Listen to what his inspired apostles say. The thief on the cross, yes. He lived under a different time and a different covenant. So did the sinful woman in Luke 7. So did Zacchaeus. They all acted on faith, and you need to, too. But under this covenant, that faith needs to lead you to repent, just like it did them, but also to be baptized to have your sins washed away. If you're in doubt as to whether you need to be baptized, ask some of the good brethren here. They will be glad to speak with you. If you're ready, come now. If you've already done so but have not been living faithfully, come back while we stand and while we sing.